Hey guys, this is Elsie Holt, and this is my weekly update for the week of July the 16th. And I've got a very special guest here with me today, Mr. Nicholas Tucci. How you doing, Nick? It's been a while. Doing real good, man. It certainly has been that. Yeah, but probably the last time I saw you was in that house, right? And I don't know if we ever put it together at uh, at, at one of the festivals, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a long time coming. Yeah, man. It has been a while. Um, I never went to any of the festivals with your next. Uh, I've done some conventions where they've shown it. Right on. Yeah. So we're the we're we're on the opposite tracks there because I that's one thing where I I haven't made it out to those yet. But yeah, I, I would certainly love to. Is that something that you would be interested in doing conventions? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I I guess of the people. To be you know, to be honest, I probably have seen Barbara more than uh, anybody else um, because she's you know she comes east on a fairly regular basis, I guess, for work and stuff like that. Uh, as Barbara Crampton, um, and I know she does a lot of that stuff, and they're they're all over the place. One guy emailed me one time about flying me to Germany, but <laughs> I never went anywhere. I probably would have done that, but when those things like those conversations like drop off two emails in, I guess it's better. I didn't get flown around the world, basically for somebody that doesn't like follow up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I've, I've heard the Germany thing too. Apparently uh, your next is very popular. Yeah. 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 Eastern European countries and in Japan. Um, yeah. I've seen a lot of really interesting Japanese shirts Mm -hmm. your next step. I mean, there's one I remember seeing where I'm kind of a cartoon character lounging under the dining room table with a glass of wine. It was really strange, but it's yeah. very Japanese. It was very interesting. You know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And they had the, um, I forget what the brand was. One of these brands came out uh, and they had a whole line of stuff and they had these shirts that were really cool because everybody was on the shirt. Like everybody's like death was... Uh, was uh, memorialized on those uh, should cavity colors maybe I don't want to say the wrong thing but yeah I was seeing those uh, online for a while yeah and I I get the sense too like I'll I'll see stuff about yeah it's um you know who, who knew I it reminds me of uh, well somebody knew obviously it it reminds me of uh, before it before anybody saw it when. Uh, um, when it was getting ready to play in Toronto for the very first time. And I had to go do some ADR with Adam and Simon, Keith and Jess, uh, you know, the producers obviously in LA. And then they had, uh, uh, an ADR list of, um, of like the soft profanities basically for the TV edit. And Simon, I think, was the one who was like, oh, it's very unlikely that this is ever going to play on TV, you know, whatever. It freaking plays on TV all the time, it plays on a sci-fi channel, and it is that sanitized version of it. So it turns out that's what they use. So, yeah. I've seen, I've seen it on there before. I've been flipping through, and suddenly, you know, there's Amy getting her neck chopped at the door. And, well, hey, there we go. Yes, man. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Toronto, that was a good uh, – was that the premiere in Toronto? Yeah, I didn't go to that actually. Um, I the first time I saw it was uh, at Fantastic Fest, which was not much later than that. I think it was only maybe a month at most. Um, but by that time, it had already, uh, you know, been acquisitioned and everything. But yeah, that Toronto. That's I I I regret going. I wish I had gone to that Toronto showing. But every time I've seen it at one of those things. It's really fun. And then the rest of the time, like one time, I guess I, um, I had, I, it was like the first year that I lived in New York and I it was like a couple on the subway. And I heard the guy was like, that was the guy who got his head in the blender, you know, or something like that. So every once in a while around Halloween, I'll see people wearing that mask that's over your shoulder there, yeah. uh, walking down the street. So yeah, it's good times. It's pretty wild. You know, a lot of people at conventions will ask me, um, when are you doing a, your next uh, convention reunion? You know, yeah. to get everyone together. And I'm like, you know, sometimes that's not as easy as you might think because there is a sort of nomadic quality to acting and to filmmaking. You can't always get the band back together. Exactly. Um, yeah. Especially this band because everybody's solo projects have been uh, uh, so, uh, you know, 
so successful and uh, intense. I don't know, everybody scattered to the four winds. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And, you know, some some guys don't want to do conventions, you know, and that's that's fine too. And But I think maybe eventually it can happen. But I keep, you know, kind of telling folks, you know, I would love to see it too, but I, I, I wouldn't hold my breath right now. Same here. I feel I have the same... My sentiments exactly. Yeah, definitely. I feel like enough people would be down for it that they could get something. It may not, you know, because I don't know. I guess I don't think about it as being, um, you know, such a large cast. But in its way, I guess it is, again, too, just because everybody, you know, and there were so many obviously, uh, you know, Renaissance uh people um, involved with it, too. So not just, you know not just sort of acting. I mean, everybody too, you know, I, I, you know, uh, uh, even the crew people, Corey Johnson, the, the AD and Clayton and stuff like that, you know, all of those people obviously helped make that movie what it is. I want to go ahead and invite them to start asking some questions if they would like to. But in the meantime, I kind of want to back up a little bit with you. I, I want to talk about pre your next and how you kind of got into acting. It's always very interesting to me. And I think interesting to other people to hear Especially people who aspire to be actors, yeah, yeah. He, how you how you you know get into the business because no one's there's no two stories that are alike. Yeah, so, definitely. So yeah. Where did your um, when did you decide? Because you started out, uh, you know, in athletics. Is that correct? You did a lot of athletic stuff, yeah, and then I did when I was in high school. Yeah, in, in high school, basically, and and <clears throat> younger than that. But yeah, as opposed to like. Yeah, I, I played football and I uh, and I was ran on the track team and I did other I played a lot of sports as a, a younger kid. Um, but no, it was only really toward the end of uh, high school that I started to, you know, to pursue acting. And it was, um, you know, it was in the theater. There was a really good children's playhouse in my hometown uh, that, you know, I just kind of I had a, a buddy who had. I think it was a one act or something like that. So it was it was kind of slow going, and it took a couple of years even into college for me to kind of get up to speed. But that's basically where you know theater wise, I didn't do there. You know they do student films and stuff like that. I was so kind of like in the the theater mentality when I was there that I really didn't do any film, and I I regretted that both because it would have been great to you know, to start to figure out what that was all about during that period. But also it's obviously, you know, the whole the whole thing in terms of building up tape and so forth for anybody that's sort of burgeoning. So many of the early years of it, I feel like um, for most people are just accumulating stuff to be able to show people on film and so forth. So, yeah. So I guess my my, you know, story, if it's unusual at all, it's because it was pretty linear um in terms of i and especially where your next is concerned i um i moved out to la and i had like four or five friends of mine that were all actors so we were all coming out of the exact same environment and going into the same environment a couple of the people that i was buddies with um in la had grown up in la so they had a, a, a better sort of uh lay of the land and as far as the you know the um the business side of things were too. So I sort of had an advantage in, in that regard. And then, yeah, it's, you know, I, I had always been a big horror fan, even when I wasn't thinking about, I don't really think I ever had a, um, another career in mind, you know what I mean? Other than like Batman or something like that. I didn't really think seriously about it. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, there was nothing else where I was like, well, if I don't do this or whatever, maybe I'll be an actor. By the time I kind of figured out that I wanted to try and be an actor, that was sort of that was sort of it uh, in terms of what I was going to do. Um, but uh, yeah. And then and I had always just been a horror fan. And so I figured that, you know, there's not in the theater, aside from maybe some Shakespeare stuff, there's not really that many like horror is really, I think, a unique to you know, to film in terms of in, in presentation in some ways, obviously liter the literary, uh, you know, uh, foundation of it is, is strong. And that's where it started with me. Um, yeah. So, you know, the first kind of bigger part that I had got 
that I got cast in was a horror movie, and a mm -hmm. guy that um, it, was it was called Choose. Okay. Um, yeah, it was with um, this wonder, a wonderful actress named Catherine Winnick, who's the the star of the TV show Vikings. Okay. Big show that Catherine's and uh, Kevin Pollock, Bruce Dern was in it. A lot of cool people were in that movie. Um, you know, so I kind of got the that was my first uh, kind of break horror wise because I was the killer in that one too, which sort of. You know, you can if you if you can get one of those killer parts. I feel like that was a, a really lucky break for me because that's how I had always sort of seen my what I that's sort of what I was interested in doing. Um, and then a, a friend of mine uh, from college, uh, a guy named Chris Peckover, um, was developing his horror movie that he had written, which was called Undocumented, which was about illegal immigration. Um, and you know, there, it was, I, I had already had a little like horror sort of nibble at that point. So Chris ended up, um, you know, letting me be in his movie and the producers of that were the producers of your next. So, um, that your next was the second movie I did with Snoot with Keith and Jess Calder. And, um, yeah, that was sort of how it, it came to pass. So it was a pretty straight it was a pretty straight line. What I always say about it is the first thing I, uh, the first like lesson I really learned in terms of the greater, the bigger picture of things in show business wise, maybe was I thought that I would have a lot more control over where I ended up in terms of what I was interested in doing. And then the first four or five years in LA, I realized I had utterly no control over it. And whatever I got or was able to work on was going to be the thing. And in my case, it just all worked out anyway, where the stuff that I was the most interested in doing ended up being the stuff that I was given the opportunity to do. Um, when, you know, a lot of it just comes down to, you know, as, as anybody, you know, knows, time and circumstance and luck and blah, 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 all those things that everybody says, it's almost cliched at this point. But um, I feel really lucky that I ended up in, you know, being able to work with the people that I did and do the kind of stuff I got to do because it was really what I wanted to do all along, you know, and it just that's, worked out. That's really, um, that's interesting because I started very much the same way in terms of my interest of horror. And, and you know, people ask, you know, did you try to get into horror? And I tell them, you know, not really. It just sort of happened that way. And yeah. I just lucked out that it was something that I'd grown up, you know, enjoying. And, it, you know, it sounds like you and I had were very similar in that way. The same thing. I mean, it's like, are you trying to get, it's like, I'm just trying to get into movies, you know? Like, I don't care what they, but, you know, uh, uh, especially in the early going, you know, I don't think you have the, the luxury so much early on to kind of decide but i guess it 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 kind of it reinforces the idea maybe that if that's what you're interested in you wear it a little bit it becomes part of your you know where you're centered and where your abilities kind of the direction that they they go in you know and uh and there's something reassuring about that too you know like i felt like i had some of the if not um, in terms of like film per se uh, uh, in the, you know, in the earlier kind of going, um, it, you know, I had some of the horror sensibilities anyway, you know, to, you know, I, that's, that's the way that I kind of look at it is, or, you know, and just people's like, I think a lot of it too comes down to even something like, your sense of humor, you know, like there's a certain thing, a horror, and not just because, you know, a lot of these, the things that, that, that people end up, uh, you know, liking the best are those kind of subversive elements to things or satirical elements or what, what have you. But I find that like my sense of humor, what I find funny or ironic or like absurd tends to align with people that are interested and engaged in the same thing. And I think that makes a big difference because it just, you know, that's, that's where everything, all the, the grist for the mill around all of this stuff comes out of, you know, like, it's not just what, what the, 
what the actual axe is that's coming barreling, you know, toward your head. It's like how you feel about that axe and like what the circumstances are. So, yeah. And there's, a, there's a tremendous uh, dark sense of humor to all of Wingard's work. Um, you know, your next being no exception. And because uh, I'd worked with him prior, you know, I've kind of known Wingard since his, he was prior to his first film, but I really met him when I was uh, auditioning for his first film, which was uh, one called uh, Homesick. Yep, yep. I know that about you. Absolutely. I remember those stories. I remember the story about you, not to interject, but the Go story ahead. I remember on your next was when they give you the note about how they wanted to emulate the wave from The Shining, the blood <laughs> wave. Remember that? And like, exactly. like yeah. 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 I was going to ask, I was going to talk a little bit about Adams, and I have, I see we have some questions from the audience, and, and I'm going to get to those here in a second, but I wanted to kind of talk about working with Wingard because um, in my experience, he has always been a great actor's director. Like, I've never actually talked to him that much on the set about what he wanted me to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if you had the same experience, but for me, I always just prepared and brought things and, and he guided me here and there. And I really like that as an actor. Um, I, I definitely want direction when I'm going way off course, which sometimes I can do if I'm not careful. Mm -hmm. But but he does just kind of let you bring stuff. He, he certainly doesn't tell you how to do it breath by breath. And I, I like that. I don't know about, about you, but I, I love that in a director. I, I agree and I had, you know, that was very similar to my experience with the, the thing that I remember the most. I mean, I remember some of the minutia about it, um, but I just remember he, he he knew exactly what he wanted um, in terms of the, you know, the take on like who the guy was. And then within those parameters, yeah, there was a lot of freedom and you could just I just remember him, you know, the thing I think is so remarkable about him is that he's like a tremendously like chill. I, I don't even say that because it, it sounds, it, you know, he, I just remember him being like very kind of like laid back and very assured, which for, I think he's like a couple years younger than me. I was very impressed by that, like that sort of generalship, so to speak, because you know, the, I feel like the circumstances, obviously people, I was watching like Predator earlier and there's no way whatever they had going on in the jungle or in Hawaii or wherever the hell they were, um, you know, it's not like we were in that. Right. I just remember that, you know, that shoot was like all those nights in a row, all night long and just being there all night. And there's something about it. And if you're at the helm, he had great people around him, but I, I really liked you know, I liked him and liked working with him for that reason. And I think the, the I think the the thing that they got out of that movie that will always be mysterious to me is just how you sort of knew what the overall plan was for that, but whether you know, like what those nudges were, because there are people that had tremendous. Everybody had tremendous license, but I feel like people did what they were going to do within certain people, let's say maybe took advantage of it more than others, um, given, given the character they were playing and what the, what the specific circumstances of the scene, obviously the dinner comes to mind and Swanberg really that whole side of the table is what we always talk about is the, you know, that the whole, the whole, uh, the whole other side and, and the so many departures that that conversation took, um, now, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I do want to mention something there. The day that I, you guys were already shooting when I arrived in Columbia, right. yeah. yeah. And the one thing I heard when I got off the plane, uh, one of the producers, Stasha Warren, um, picked me up at the uh, airport. Yeah. And she said, man, you just missed something. And I said, what did I miss? And she said, well, the last five days they've been filming a dinner scene. Right, right, <laughs> right. And uh, and I kind of asked more about it, and I was like, "Well, why did it take so long?" And they said, "Well, because they're getting great material because the guys at the table are just starting to make make shit up, you yeah. know." Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, since you were in that scene, uh, what what was that like? Was it? It must have been kind of interesting, huh? Fun. So I rem so 
the 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 other th people were saying that they could have and not you know not devoid of any seriousness people were saying there could have been a whole other feature that was just that dinner so it's just this weird dinner and then the last thing that that happens is ty gets shot in the forehead with a crossbow bolt um and then the sequel is what what your next is minus that point but yeah no it was basically it was uh you know, it, it, it was that side of the table. It was Ty and Amy Ty West and Amy Simons and uh, and uh, Sarah Myers and Joe Swanberg. And then AJ, AJ was sort of in the corner on the other end. And but it was really that side of the table just went off. Um, and yeah, it took a whole, like a whole day. There was an entire day where nobody got up and nothing happened. And it was just that side of the table. And the, the funniest one that I always say is just in terms of, and I guess it speaks to Adam and Simon too, and everybody, the producers and everybody that, you know, you talk about having, giving people license and so forth. The thing that I always remember about that was Ty, they were trying to figure out what Ty's character's day job was going to be, what his straight job was going to be while he was making commercials or whatever he's making documentary commercials and at one point they decided they, they were saying he was working at a co-op so a grocery store but one of those grocery stores where you come and you like work for the grocery store one weekend a month no nothing i got nothing against it it's not i don't go to that gross that kind of grocery store but i i know people who do right uh, and then in a subsequent take ty you know rob moran or whoever was like so what do you do uh, for a living? And he said, I work at Home Depot. <laughs> and, and they and then we they played the rest of that that takeout. And then there was this sort of like uh, communication kind of like flittering, you know, f flying around around the table that came back to Ty. And they decided that um, H Home Depot was too, like there was something about Home Depot that didn't that didn't wash because it made it seem like he was, I, I forget whatever the, whatever the, the sort of aspersion was, but then on the next take, uh, uh, Ty comes up with it. And the same question gets asked and Ty says again, uh, I work at a home Depot corporate, you know, <laughs> a little bit and go figure. They didn't use <laughs> that one either. But uh, it was stuff like that, yeah. And then just variations on. And I think the thing too for people to watch that movie, the cool thing about it is that, yeah, it probably took fifteen hours or whatever to get everything squeezed out of that take. But what you see in the movie, I feel like, is remarkably representative of like the tenor of everything that happened in that scene overall. You know. So in other words, I don't think that there were is anything that that left out what they were going for. They, they definitely, I feel like got in, in spades and um, yeah, it was really, really fun to watch. And one of those things too, just in terms of like, you know, the, the design of, of stuff, because you get such a good, the way I felt like it worked out was the people who you're not going to get to be around uh, as much um, were the ones who really came through so loud and clear in that scene. And the people who are more maybe recalcitrant as part of that conversation have more to do, you know, so I, I just thought it was really, really smart and really well put together the way that, you know, what they, what they chose, what they ended up using. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's, and it's worth saying too, that in spite of this, Adam is incredibly good with scheduling. I don't think we were ever behind schedule at all, even with all the improvisations. Yeah, definitely. They had they because they had. I think they wisely had given themselves the the you know the real estate basically to do that. And they said, yeah, this is going to take a long time. Maybe not for the reasons they thought, you know. And and uh, but uh, but it certainly it certainly did work out. And and that was a big. When I read the script for the first time, that was the scene um, that I really was hooked in with. Because, and, and it wasn't necessarily because of the bubbling tensions. That, that was just because all those people were so awesome 
at, at, at doing that. I mean, it was certainly there in the script, but the big thing in the script was just, you know, it's like, oh, this uh, nice kind of dinner and these there's these little kind of like miscommunications or whatever, this bickering and so forth. And then somebody just like sees something kind of like weird out the window and then it's on, you know? That was what I thought was so cool about that. And that all came from just the way Simon wrote it, you know? That was, that was pretty much all there. It was a smart thing, I think. Is it during the dinner scene, uh, was, were they running multiple cameras? Because I remember sometimes Wingard operating a camera and, uh, and the DP operating a camera. Surely they had to have multiple cameras on that, that scene. I think you're right. And I do remember Adam operating uh, along with Andrew. Um, that's maybe during that scene. I just remember it was, you know, the stuff you remember, you don't remember. I, I was probably less cognizant back then than I am now, I think, in terms of like the technical, I, I've kind of gotten more up to speed um, on that. But I think that sounds right. I, honestly, like what I was thinking about, um, you know, take to take, what I was worried about were like the snap keys and whatnot for the reset with the food. Because I had had this thing on the previous one where there was a big breakfast scene with pancakes and, you know, you have your business. So I remember having the syrup and like, whatever and somebody came in and was like oh you know we gotta like do this every time now so during that i was just like don't touch the food just like try to try to pretend like you're in this scene then it's the thing about that dinner too it's like no one's eating it's not you know it's one of those movie things where they have this great it looks like thanksgiving or whatever and everybody's just maybe like drinking a little grape juice and like playing with their food a little bit it's really just about the conversation and that, that is something uh, interesting to note is that a lot of the times you have an art department and they do have to watch out for the continuity of things like that, the food on the table. I remember even when I flipped the table, they said, you know, we got to take photos or something. <laughs> right, right. We'll never, we'll never be able to, to recreate this. Exactly. Yeah. Because right. you have to go because the next time you see it, you know, a plate has to be in the same place that it fell. Luckily, when I flipped the table, it went totally over and it actually fell on top of the food. So, right. I, right. you yeah. know, it, yeah, it worked out great. I think the art department loved me for that because yeah, you know, they took the rest of the day off. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And we actually had a lot of stuff to do in that dining room. You and I filmed. Couple. Yes, we did. We were back there, right? That's interesting. Yeah, how how that that ended up coming back around, and it just worked so well in terms of the uh, you know the layout of that place served that story so well. They made it, they dressed it in a certain way, but architecturally, I felt like it worked too. Yeah, yeah, that house was amazing because there are places in that house you don't see in the film. I mean, you probably see a you see a small fraction. It's true. It's true. Okay. There's a lot, a lot of stuff in that house that that went unfilmed for because we were all up there too. We were like existing there because it's it just became uh, it became the the home base. There was a whole other store floor to that house is what it was. It was a whole other floor that that nobody touched. That was where all the production was. Yeah, was located. Um, That's where the crafts were. That's where the uh, wardrobe was where we changed where we ate yep all the offices and i remember when they did wide shots of the house they had to you know let people know don't walk past the windows because yeah exactly right they're gonna see yeah it's gonna we're gonna spoil somebody's somebody's art yeah you didn't remember to lock your door like somebody's up there i wonder what the name of that house somebody must know uh, yeah. If any of you out there watching know the name of the house, I'd love to know too, because I don't know. I, I heard that they have put a, a gate around it or a fence. Uh-huh. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember it was it was in some, you know, it had to be brought up to, um, you know, it was in a transitional period in its life as a, as a house when we filmed there. It wasn't a, people weren't living there, I don't think, like at that time. I wonder whether... But it was obviously a beautiful house, and, uh, and we had to be very, very careful too. I mean, I remember even when uh, you know I was on the floor and I had all that blood on me getting up. I had to be careful where I put my feet because yeah. I could put my bloody feet on the hardwood floor. I mean, it was yeah. Mm -hmm. And for a house where so much mayhem happens, it's you know you have a kind of a whole crew to make sure that doesn't the door doesn't get nicked, the window because they had to take a window out and replace it with a a, a um, exact replica for 
uh, Renee Moneymaker to jump through uh, yeah. double crying. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. No, of course. Yeah. I forgot she had that uh, fantastic name. Right. I remember her. I just didn't remember the last name. That's a good call. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I remember the hardwood floor, obviously. And as you know, you don't want your DNA in there, man. You know? I know. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Get on that wood. It's going to be there forever. I know. I mean, there was a scene actually where I had you pinned up against a wall, and yeah. I'm there, yeah. and I'm doing the scene, and I'm thinking, at one point in one take, it came into my mind. I'm like, oh fuck, I'm standing on the hardwood. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. Definitely. It's like I'm trying to strangle you, and all I'm thinking about is the hardwood. You know. Definitely. And then when you're, you know. They had, I remember the bathroom they had on the second floor, too. It was really old-fashioned fixtures and, like, a clawfoot tub. And everybody would just, that you know, everybody would just be absolutely festooned with blood. And they'd be like, get in the tub. <laughs> you know, like, don't touch anything. Just get in the tub. That's right. I took many a shower in that tub. And what a lot of people don't know is that that blood, when it hardens, it pretty much plasters your clothes to your body. I mean, it's like glue. Um, I mean, essentially, it's corn syrup. Yeah, a reality I know all too well. Right, it turns yeah, it turns them into to to cardboard basically. But yeah, just yeah. completely stuck. Yeah. Then you get the uh, the honor of peeling, you know, your shirt off for the next half hour. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. But, uh, I want to go to a couple of the questions here. They've been very patient. Um, Zach asked a question. This is for both of us. He says, what do you guys do as actors to get into the villainous frame of mind of your characters? So, Nick, do you want to take that one first? Uh, that's a good question. A guy told me one time um, to, uh, to go about my day, it was before an audition is actually the way I guess I should, I'll, I'll answer the question. A lot of it, a lot of it, generally speaking for me is stuff that I think is like cool for lack of a better way of putting it. Like this would be a cool way to do this or do that. But a guy did tell me one time when I had an audition for a serial killer villainous character, which I ended up getting. So it was good advice, which is why I didn't forget it. He was like, you know, between now and then you got five hours, you know, don't do anything to anybody, but, but stay in this frame of mind. When you look at people, try to think about that kind of like predation and be that kind of person, get those juices going, you know, there's limits to what you can do with the method in terms of like certain of these things. But, um, but I thought that was really good advice. And those are the things too. I always think of it also as like, you know, plagiarizing people and the just sort of a melange of all the villainous people that I've always loved and, you know, some little thing or idea or whatever. Um, a lot of it I think comes from inspiration, uh, from stuff that I internalized either consciously or or unconsciously from stuff that I liked because that's sort of the way my tastes run. So, yeah, I agree completely. I mean, I, the, the only way I've ever known how to act really is um, to try and understand and feel the thing as much as possible. So I, that was something that, that uh, I've always tried to do um, with, uh, you know, I guess the technical term would be sense memory, which I find to be a very, very useful tool. I use it all the time. Um, uh, and so that's kind of what, the, kind of the, the way I think about it is, um, you know, if I can approximate an emotion based on something that happened in my life, it doesn't have to be uh, specific to what's happening in the script or in the movie at that scene. It just has to be somewhat like the emotion that the character's feeling. Um, you know, the best, that, that's the best way I know how to put it. When I flipped the table, I was thinking about somebody that pissed me off one time, you know, and it's that simple really. Uh, um, you know, when I think about it, uh, is that, is that something you, you use a lot the the sense memory? Yeah. It's a de I, I think it depends on the, um, you know, it, it, it depends on who the character, how close the character is maybe to like me in like specific moments and, and so forth. But yeah, I definitely think that um, you know any any time you can kind of 
have those, I don't know, a lot of it, I, I, it's still evolving for me. So I think I'm figuring out new things that, that occurred to me and, you know, particularly where, you know, more, uh, uh, broader emotions or more sort of extreme emotions and, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, it, it, it has to be, I feel like coming from, from somewhere. And it's always like the stuff you didn't meet, you know, I always find like the best stuff is the stuff that you didn't mean to do. You found it right at that moment, you know, and especially with things like violence and, and some of the uh, scarier stuff. But th I think that pretty much covers the, the, the villainous question. We have, uh, there seems to be a theme in a lot of these questions. Yeah. And the theme seems to be uh, highlighted by uh, Colby Keefe's um, question. He says, uh, can we expect something with you two working together again? Right on. Um, uh, I'd love to work with, with Nick again. Um, Absolutely, but I, I don't. We don't have any plans at the moment. Uh, <laughs> this dude, get it going, man! It's his thing. It's his ball to run with. I'm, I'm down for it. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that would be, a, that would be a good idea. I mean, unless they. That was the other joke about your next was that, you know, uh, you find out one version. I feel like of the sequel is like the whole family is werewolves. You know, so it's like. <laughs> You know, and like coming back and whatever. And in that case, I don't know if you guys are werewolves too. You might be. <laughs> you might be. <laughs> it would make sense that we were werewolves, or maybe the family were vampires and we were werewolves. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. It just turns into underworld. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Like yeah. world twilight sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, yeah man. I mean, I, I, I mean, a lot of people are wondering when when you and I are going to do another horror movie. Um, I don't, it's not as easy as that all the time, you know? I mean, you, uh, you, Soon I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't, you know, what's interesting is, um, I don't know if it's interesting, it's interesting to me is that I, I had not, I think all I had really done that was like really horror, um, as opposed to just more psychological thriller, you know, it, the things, these things, tend to evolve also it was nothing that i considered really like a true a uh, horror movie since your next um uh until this past winter um where i did a sort of a kind of a monster in the house uh genre uh movie um so yeah so it's been a good long time but it's definitely my roots and the thing that i find the most interesting and i think is you know is a perennial um, just, you know, recession proof and not even just eco economically too, but like creative recession wise, horror is always going to be there. The fact that it's so hot right now and all these big properties are getting done, um, I think is just a, an issue of degree. Um, so yeah, if, if they, uh, yeah, if they're going to, they're going to keep making them, I'm definitely going to try to keep keep being involved with them for as long as possible. And yeah, I think I, I, I agree that, uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be great for our, our paths to, you know, to cross. And, and particularly because that's very much in the spirit of, of your next, um, itself where so many of those people were, were collaborators for a long time and have continued to be collaborators. Um, I think it's only right. Yeah. That, uh, that something like that should come to pass. Uh, before too long. But as you mentioned, it's extremely difficult too. you know, it's just one of those things. It's a reality of uh, the business, no matter where you, I think, find yourself, you're always going to be um, not vulnerable, but you're always going to be a subject to time, you know, and like, sometimes it's having enough time. And sometimes it's having too much time and and time time going by. But that's the other great thing about the business and the art form is that, you know, if you can, if, if you're still walking around, you still got a shot at it. That's the way I feel about it. You know, you're never counted out. You're never dead. You know, you always have a chance for that coming back. It's not like the, not like, like 
professional baseball or something like that. I feel like, you know, where when you're done, you're done. Like you always got another game in you. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. And it's actually a good way to start uh, wrapping up. Sadly, we're going to have to wrap up here soon. Um, but that's that's a- absolutely true. Um, you know, you never know. I might come back as, uh, you know, because eventually I'm sure this is another thing that was asked. And I'll touch on this real quick before we go. But uh, if, if if ever they made uh, uh, your next remake, what would I think about that? And, you know, my thing is, I don't know, because by the time they get around to doing that, I'll be so old, I probably won't care. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, honestly, uh, because it's going to take a while. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they eventually did, you know, a remake of that. I don't know about you, Nick. What do you think? I'd want to play the dad. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Hey, that's a good idea. That's a, that's a great idea. I could see that for sure. And maybe I could just play the lamb mask and I'll come back and I'm just old right, as hell. Right. right. Yeah. They, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 you, we, we can only hope that, uh, you know, that, that somebody does that someday and they make it cool. And, uh, you know, it's certainly, uh, you know, I just think we're both, uh, you know, it's it's a rare thing. It's not something I think that everybody gets to enjoy is is being part of a movie like this that that so many people enjoyed and you know uh, really had its day and continued to. I mean, the, the thing that I find the coolest about it now is, you know, you, you don't know you don't know until uh, until you kind of been there in the fullness of time, but people are continuing to watch the movie. And I feel like follow people. I certainly have felt the effect very strongly, um, you know, in my own life since, since being in that house in terms of, you know, uh, the one good, one good anal or it's not even an analogy. It's just the anecdote is, uh, I uh, I did a movie uh, with Larry Fessenden for Larry Fessenden's company. Um, but I never met Larry because they filmed Larry's scene right at the beginning and I wasn't there. You kill him, obviously. Right. I, I wasn't there for any of that. So I never met Larry until um, he and I were working on this this new movie in New York. And the first thing he said to me was, so how's life been after you're next? And I really, when he said that, it, it did strike that chord. The answer was great. And, uh, and it really was that kind of... Uh, uh, a watershed moment where there there is like a a byn and an ayn certainly in my life and and you know as an actor and everything i'm i'm really grateful for that part of it and uh you know it's still one of those cool movies i i frankly think more people the idea that they <clears throat> you know the the set out was to make a movie that would be engaging to people in a certain environment, a certain, it can play lots of different ways, but, you know, I hope that the, the intention, which is even years from now, people will be watching it late at night and together in a big theater, which I think is the most fun way to see it. And I think people will see things, get things out of that movie in that kind of environment that are unique to that experience. That's why I think it's so cool about it and why it's so well-made. And, you know, they're really rooting for Sharni and that's what it's all about and hating us, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that's right. And that is it's something I see all the time at these conventions. You know, it amazes me that people, um, you know, you do a lot of movies and the movies a lot of times don't have a life at all. And occasionally you'll come across one or two and be fortunate enough to be a part of them and they really live on. And that's something about your next. that's it's pretty amazing to me. Yeah, I agree, one hundred percent, man. I, I I owe those guys a lot, and everybody that I got to work with, I feel like had a had a huge impact on me. That you know that I try to to carry around as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. And, and not one has has come come close to it in my own experience yet in terms of the number of sequential overnights in a row. So there's that part of it too. Yeah, I'm looking looking to get back into that that state of mind because I haven't been yet. Where, yeah. Oh. It was a lot of there were a lot of nights on that. Night. It was one long night, a long night of the soul. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, Nick, I want to really thank you for coming out and uh, talking to me this morning. This has been a lot of fun catching up with you, and uh, there's so much we could talk about. I mean, we could do more of these. And- absolutely, I would love to do more. I would love to do 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 this again. I appreciate the invite, and yeah, great. 
great to talk to you as well, man. Um, I'm glad you're doing this. And, uh, and yeah, I'm glad that, uh, you know, it, it makes you, uh, it makes me happy. I feel like that, uh, people have connected with this and continue to connect with it. So if there's something that, you know, that, that I could do for, for one of those people, I'd be happy to do it because it's appreciated. Absolutely. I completely agree. And actually, there's one more thing I want to mention because it popped up on the chat and I am just fascinated by this question. And this is all for you, Nick. Yeah. Uh, Eli DeGreer, he said, is, is Nick's cat aware of their celebrity status? I like to think he is. I, I don't know what goes on in his head um, other than trying to get in movies and watch movies and whatever else, uh, grocery stuff. I, I do a lot of thinking about what that cat's thinking about. I don't know, no, he's got it. Um, yeah, I, I think I think he's better off not not knowing the, the reach he has, but uh, <laughs> that's, I think that's a good question. If, if, if anybody out there can offer any insight, um, they're more than welcome to come meet him and see if they can get a beat on that. I don't know what he's thinking about. He's think I think mostly he's thinking I want I want like one of those pressed corn cat snacks and that's like from hour to hour. <laughs> hey, I don't know. That is hilarious. That's great. Well, I think our next our next conversation will be solely about Nick's celebrity cat. Um, until then, I'd like to thank Nick again for joining me here, and I'd like to thank all you guys for joining me. And, um, you know, like and subscribe to this channel. I, as I was saying earlier during one of our brief pauses, I got a very, um, another special guest next week. So um, I want to invite you guys to come and, uh, and, and watch that live broadcast. And again, Nick, this was a great, this was a great time, man. Um, yeah, man, absolutely. I, I really enjoyed it, definitely. And, uh, yeah, please, anytime, uh, just ask, and I'd, I'd be happy to do it again. And we'll do it, man. Um, until then, I will see you guys later. Take care of yourselves.